Fixing My Faith. I'm your host, Bern Hool. And for those of you that do not know me, uh, if this is your first time on this channel, today we are in month six of my awakening and uh, from my woke up process. So I've been sharing online, real time, uh, what I've been dealing with, what I've been researching, and what I've been finding. And you as the audience, the subscribers, have been helping with comments and questions and, and more or less leading me into certain directions. And if it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't have went down some of these paths that I'm going down now. And uh, today I'm going to share an amazing breakthrough that I think. And uh, it's so amazing, this breakthrough, if you look at the thumbnail, there's several little puzzles and we show uh, the, the, the pieces of the puzzle. Well, for any of us XJWs that come out of the organization, we feel perhaps that our faith is a bit shattered. I know I did. I started piecing it back together six months ago. And uh, one piece at a time, we start working with that puzzle. And then what we when we get these puzzles together and we figure, well, Jesus is the way, the life, the truth, not the organization, not the, not the uh, um, governing body, but it's Jesus. Then we, we end up in another path. Well, who is Jesus? Is Jesus a deity? Is Jesus, because we were taught different things. So this leads to another path and another path. So I've been having a bit of fun with it. And I've been sharing this with you online real time some of my research. Well, today, folks, I feel that the veil has been unlifted. That's what I feel. It's been a couple of days. We've been researching hard here. So here's the first scripture. We've shared this before, 2 Corinthians 3 and 16. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And you notice those are Paul's words. I don't have a problem with Paul for any of you, of you out there that think I do. <laughs> I'm just objectively exploring everything and if it means exploring paul i'm going to explore paul ultimately we know god is in charge and if god wants the holy word to go down through history through a snaky path so be it that's that's the road it went it's here and this is what we have to work with so there's no reason why i can't work with what paul says so i like this he says when one turns to the lord when one turns to god this veil is removed. And this is a bit of a search. For me, it's been a bit of a search. So the next scripture, uh, when I think of God, uh, who is God? Well, God is love. 1 John 4 and 16. Very simple right here. God is love. Uh, here, here John says, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Now we're going to explore this in a way that I've never explored it before about God abiding within us. Have you ever thought of that? God is love. So let's take this a step further. Um, Isaiah 52 and verse 6. Uh, it says, well, let's just go back there. God is love. So let's, let's talk about God. God is love. Are we not made in God's image? Man is made in God's image. So therefore, God is love. So made in God's image. Genesis 1 and 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. And, and all the way through, we, we see this being so. Colossians in the New Testament. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So here, uh, Jesus is referred to as the image of the invisible God. So in, in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, Genesis, God created man in his own image. So man is also in God's image. Just Is it like Jesus being in God's image? good question I don't have the answer um, we can go to the scriptures uh, what I'm looking for here second Corinthians in their case the God of this wicked world has blinded the minds of unbelievers um, what about believers could believers be blinded it's my question 
to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So that means we, we could be blinded from, from seeing this image, with understanding what this image is. Uh, let's go a little further. James 3 and 9. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. So the point that I'm getting there is, is, is people are made in the likeness of God. And the, even the people that are being cursed, even everyone is made in the likeness of God. So what does that mean? We're going to explore that. John 4 and 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. What does that mean to worship God in spirit and truth? God is spirit. So we can't see God. Uh, in fact, let's just go down here. John 1 and 18. No one has ever seen God. So that means Moses didn't see God up in the mountain. Uh, they heard God. They didn't see God. They seen a burning bush. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So it's talking about Jesus in a, in a God sense, in a capital, like the same as God. And this is where this Trinity thing becomes, uh, or the, the, the deity becomes, uh, you know, we, we wonder about it. But, but when we think that there was God, and if God, God's first creation was Jesus, then Jesus would be like God, God's only creation. So he'd get that capital G title, he'd be like God, same thing. God's only creation, and he is at the Father's side. So Jesus has made God known to you and I. Galatians, there's neither Jew nor slave nor Greek. They're all made female, female and male. We're all one in Christ. So we're all one in God, because God is Christ. Same thing. We're all one in God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen the glory, and the glory is a son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word from God, the word is a God. Jesus came to us. So became Jesus when he came to us. Now, Jesus, Yeshua would be the uh, accurate title when we think uh, back then. Uh, the word Jesus and Jehovah did not, for those of you that are wondering, Jesus, Jehovah did, did not come about until the Latin language came about. And that's where these uh, J's were thrown in. The real names were Yeshua and Yahweh. Those are the real names. Second Corinthians. Um, we can go on and on. So uh, we even get into that, John 1 and 1. The beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, so we see that Jesus, being God's only creation, gets that capital G title. So it's like my son gets my, my last name, my son. <clears throat> he gets to carry my last name. It's kind of the same thing. Now, <clears throat> we looked at a few scriptures. Um, I, I, this one, uh, as an ex-Jehovah's Witness, therefore my people shall know thy name, and therefore in that day they shall know, th know that it is, and I who speak, here I am. So how do you know the name if we look at the Old Testament, the Torah, for example, that name, Yahweh, has been taken out of the Bible 6,880 times, something like that, almost 7,000 times. Why did man take, you see, I, I, I feel personally, and this is just my first personal belief, I realize we don't use the name in vain, we don't use it in a bad name, but here, you know, the Bible's telling us to, to broadcast a name, people should know that name. And if we take it out of the Bible, 7,000 times that God actually inspired it to be in there, but man takes it out due to his own wisdom or control again remember folks control money and power right from the very beginning so that's why they did that and leviticus you, you just teach people you do you shall not swear by thy name falsely and so profane the name of your god i am the lord we had on one of our other videos where the jehovah's witness articles tends to put in the word jehovah a whole pile of times in their own writing their own language 
And they use that name as a whip or as a corral. And God is not in God did not write his name for them to use it like that. And, and I feel, according to Leviticus, it's using the name falsely. I think if that name is in the Bible 7,000 times, isn't that enough places for a name to use? Just use it in the scriptures. Let God speak for what he wrote. Why do we need to use his name to corral people or to whip people or to scare people? So that's one of the problems I have with religion. Uh, Matthew 6 and 9, pray in this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So, so here Jesus is telling us to pray to, to bring honor to the name. Well, if we don't know what the name is, you know, wouldn't it be, if, if, if you were the author, the inventor, the maker of mankind, and you want your name, you put your signature on, on the human being, wouldn't you want your name known, your signature? I think so. An author of a book just doesn't put, this is written by a man from Westlock or from an area, this is written by so-and-so. That's what an author puts on his book. He, you know, The names are important. Exodus 20 and 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And, and this is where why the name got removed by man out of the Bible so that no one would use it in vain. So uh, that was man's thing. So we looked at a few things. We looked at God's name. We looked at we are made in God's image. God is love. Who is God? God is love. So that means that if God is love, we're made in his image. When we're putting out love, it doesn't matter even if we don't believe in God. If we're an atheist and we don't even believe in God, we don't even know, but we're putting out love. We're putting out God's energy. We're made in God's image. So I thought that's an important one. And the veil is being lifted. So we have one other scripture we're going to look at at the very end, but we have a couple of short videos I want to share with you. And uh, this, this opened my eyes. This is where the veil started to lift. And a lot of this stuff started to make sense. So here's a fella. Um, you might recognize him. His name is Greg Braden, and this is his official video. He wrote a book, and I'm going to let him speak for himself. So here he is. We're going to watch about 10 minutes of this. The study of that code is called Gematria, and it was actually formalized. The laws, 32 laws of Gematria, were formed in the second century. They were formalized in the second century. And the only way Gematria works is, is you cannot deviate from these laws. They're specific laws that apply to the numbers. So our ancestors were also talking about life using words and numbers. So they have the letters of the alphabets and this mysterious mm -hmm. number. We're using the periodic table. We got a whole bunch of numbers. Right. My job was to find out which of those numbers equates to the numbers in the ancient alphabets. And if I could do that, my thinking was it would be possible to look at human DNA, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, mm -hmm. and different combinations of that and substitute the ancient letters for the numbers based upon this correlation. This, in retrospect, it was simple, but not knowing that it took years, right. took me 12 years. And to, did you break it? To find what we now know is that the atomic mass of the elements, the numbers of the atomic mass are the numbers that equate to the mysterious letters in the ancient alphabets. What that means is when you look at human DNA, or the DNA, DNA of, of any life, it is made of hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and using gematria, the numbers that equate to those become one, five, six, and three. Three is with the carbon. And when you then take a table, one of the ancient tables, and you're able to, to correlate those numbers with the letters, what we find, George, is that the human DNA is, is our Does genome match? is built in, in layers, and at the top layers, it's like every book has an introduction. The introduction in every cell of every form of life, carbon-based DNA, mm -hmm. the introduction is the same. And the first translation literally reads, literal, God eternal within the body. Hmm. God eternal within the body. And the God that is depicted in the DNA is actually spelled the way that the name of God was spelled in the ancient text before it was removed 6,800 times. 
in the Torah, for example. The, the sacred name of God is believed to be so sacred it cannot be written in its entirety. Why put it in a code? You know, this was, uh, so first as a scientist, what I have to say is this, people say, why is the code there? Yeah. And I say, I don't know. All I know is that when I followed the instructions in a 3,000 year old text and I applied it to the periodic table, this, there is, what, it was. this is what we have. Next question, is it a coincidence? So there are a, no coincidences. I had, well, I had a statistician write the numbers for me, and the odds of this happening by chance are 1 to 234,256. So yeah. 234,256 to 1 are the odds, or 0.00041%. Mm -hmm. Right. Those are the odds that it's, an, it's just, uh, just random. Just random. Now, those aren't astronomical odds. I, I thought it might be like 1 to a bajillion, you know. But when you take into account Still not, not only is the language there, but when you take into account what the words say, that those words actually have meaning, God eternal within the Bible. And they all say that. The, the first letter in all human DNA, if, if you could look at the what's called the, the genetic code, CTAG, uh, every one of those is made up of combinations of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, right. and they, they are arranged, I don't want to be really technical when I talk about this, but they're, they're arranged uh, different numbers of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen atoms. So within each of the DNA bases that make our DNA as it is, there are different combinations of CTAG that break down to different combinations of God eternal within the body. And the God within ourselves, within our DNA, is literally the, the same spelling uh, of the, the God that was taken from those texts. Now, here's the beauty. I just have to say this. All right. My first fear was I found it in the Hebrew language. And I said, does that mean, could it actually be divisive if it only is found in one language? And when the research went to its fruition, what we found is it is in Hebrew and Aramaic and Sanskrit, three of the root languages. The same thing. Exactly the same thing. So in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Sanskrit, the, the code for those letters translates precisely the same in the human DNA. That's the first layer. In your opinion, that slogan, God eternal, is in the body. What did that mean? What it tells me uh, is because the odds of that happening by chance are, are, astronomical. are, are steep, it tells me there's an intentionality. Now, who or what, I, I don't know the answer to that, but that tells me that, uh, that the DNA, the way it's formed, uh, is, uh, it is intentional. And then I began to think, uh, in our modern world, we're creators, we're mm -hmm. artists. Whenever we create something that we're proud of, what's, when we're finished, what's the last thing we do when we finish it, George? You, you tell me, what is the last thing we do with something? We finish a painting, and what's the last thing we do when we finish that painting? You sign it. We put our name on it. If there's an intentionality underlying life itself and human life specifically, it would make tremendous sense to me that who or whatever is responsible would somehow have left a sign. Is it God's signature? I believe that, how, however we define that, whoever, whatever we believe that creator is. My next question is, why not put it into a text or into a temple wall? And then my thinking was, why place that signature into something that can crumble over a few thousand years, like a temple wall, or into a, the pages of a book mm -hmm. that can be destroyed, why not put it into creation itself? And as long as the creation exists, the message exists as well. I published this in 2004, even though the research was incomplete, it, it was complete to that point, and I wanted to share this with the world. 2007, Japanese scientists released a report, peer-reviewed report, on the feasibility of storing data in DNA for thousands of years. And what they were looking at is, is bacteria. They were looking at storing information in bacteria and placing the bacteria in nuclear waste dumps, for example. And letting it sit there. And letting it sit there because the papers might disintegrate or something else might happen, yeah. but if, if they could do it. So 2007 huh. was the first time they successfully implanted a message into the DNA of a bacteria. And they use bacteria because... Hoping that someone in the future one day would use it? 
Well, this was a test. Yeah. They used the bacteria because they have a short lifespan, so they could see how many generations, you know, for bacteria, the generations may be just a few days. So yeah. the, the code they put into the DNA, it was... Uh, Don't say it was the same thing. No, it was right. Einstein's theory of all. It was <laughs> e, e equals MC squared in the year 1905. They encoded that into the DNA. They allowed it, <clears throat> the DNA, to replicate for 25 generations with that code with the code they pulled the code right How out bizarre. completely intact so what they're they're now demonstrating uh purely uh, in a, a, the scientific realm is the feasibility of storing literal information uh in the in the genome in the dna and it remains intact for as long as the organism remains intact well here's the puzzling part if you put a code in there you're doing it for one of several reasons. One, you're hiding it. Or two, you're trying to pass information on to some future generation. So let's assume that that's what that is. Mm -hmm. When we extract it and we get that code, what do we do with it? What's it mean? I think it depends on what the code says. Now we know, and the work is progressing from this point. And in 2015, uh, another layer will have been completely decoded, and hopefully you and I can have this conversation, and I'll share what, what we find next. Okay, so <clears throat> that's all we're going to do on that for now. Um, I thought that was uh, fabulous. Uh, I'm going to play another little video to show what he's thinking about now, this guy, because I was watching a few of his, but I just wanted to pull this out. But if you could imagine that God has his signature in all of us, just through our DNA. And uh, if it wasn't for the Jewish Bible, the Torah, that was so carefully preserved by the Jewish people, this this guy wouldn't have been able to figure this out, this Greg Brayton. And, and he's just a scientist. To, in fact, he started working on this stuff uh, right at the tail end of the Cold War. Uh, he was working for the U.S. military. And he was working on coding and DNA coding and things like that. And it led him to what if, what if, because everything's numbers. And what's interesting in the Torah and some of the Sanskrit and Aramaic languages is that they use numbers to equivalent to equal the letters. And one of our um, subscribers was sending me some stuff on this. And I'm going to do some more research, but this is, fabulous stuff it's 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 just to me it changes things because to me now it tells me that uh, you know what those jewish people were very important they might not have all the answers but they had an important task and to carry the torah down this far because what if as they start to unravel the dna what if the dna tells a whole big story what if we get a, bi a new bible out of our dna uh, by transcribing this back to the Hebrew language. And we need people that really speak Hebrew. <laughs> so anyways, let's let's keep moving on. This is kind of exciting. Let's see what this guy is doing next. We're just going to watch a minute of this. And this is where he, he is now. I pulled this video up. It's just like a year ago. So here it is. More than the laws of, of physics and biology that we us to believe. And there's a power within us that transcends uh, those limits. And it's that power uh, that empowers us to participate uh, in, in a, a beautiful change in our planet and a beautiful change in our bodies uh, to become the, the greatest potential of who we are rather than live in the limits of what we've always believed. I do believe in life after death, and I, I believe that death is probably not what we've always believed it is. It's a continuation. The evidence is overwhelming. Uh, scientific evidence, uh, anecdotal evidence as well, cultural evidence. Uh, that we are part of this field that is now being called the divine matrix. Um, that this field of energy, when I talk about that field of energy, what I found is people tend to think of it as being somewhere else. So if we can think of this field of energy that bathes creation as, as a big, thick blanket uh, with lots of fibers, and you and me and everyone listening to this in our lives, our world, are all within the fibers of that blanket. And it's a relatively smooth field of energy, and every once in a while, uh, it crystallizes into a rock or a tree or a human or a river. Uh, it helps us to kind of get a sense that we're, we're part of that field. Um, what we know is that consciousness 
crystallizes quantum possibilities into the physical realities of our world. And these bodies are physical realities. When the bodies are gone, that consciousness is still there as a quantum, a quantum possibility, a quantum reality. Uh, and it appears the evidence I think is overwhelming that uh, that we continue and cycle through that way. So, so the answer is yes. Maybe not. Not in the way that you and I are having a conversation in this moment, but the, the essence that's Michael or the essence that's Greg, I think will be around for, for a while. So, what did you think of that? <laughs> so this guy, uh, the, the previous video was uh, some of his research back in 2004, and then he said by 2015. So this is a year ago, and we're 2022. So uh, it's fabulous. Now, just so it's just not one guy, I wanted to, because you know how I am. I like to do my research, and uh, I don't just believe in one guy, because maybe he's just writing a book, and making his millions or trillions. Let's look at this guy. This guy writes books, too. All these smart guys write books. So you might recognize this guy, Dr. Michio. I don't know if I said his name but uh he's he's here let's listen to just a minute of him and see In what the he future, thinks aliens will digitize themselves uh we're already digitizing ourselves with the internet and stuff like that we're going to digitize our personality and put our soul our digitized soul on a laser beam and shoot it throughout a space at the speed of light at the speed of light we will conquer the universe we will explore the universe without rockets, without accidents, without radiation, without weightlessness, as pure energy, digitized energy on laser beams scattered throughout the universe. And on the moon, there could be a mainframe that downloads your, your soul, your digitized soul on the moon. And there's an avatar, an avatar that looks like you is superhuman, super strong, super beautiful, super gorgeous, whatever, walking on the moon, colonizing the universe at the speed of light. That's how the aliens, I think, are going to explore the universe, not with rocket ships. I mean, that's so that's so uh, 60s technology. <laughs> it's going to be harder to steal from them in this scenario, though. <laughs> that's right. The aliens are going to be thousands of years ahead of us, and they're going to digitize themselves and send their digital uh, signature to explore the universe at the speed of light. Think about that. In 100,000 years, they can, they can explore the entire galaxy. Wow. All right, let me ask you, uh, we just had a, a question. So that's all we'll watch. So there's another scientist's viewpoint on who we are, this energy within us. So uh, I'm just going to uh, close off this uh, particular video just with a few scriptures. And uh, these scriptures I just plugged into my little Bible tool called Awakening. And that's really, I think, what this is, science. Uh, now is uh, being interlaced with the Bible, with the Torah, the numbers. And now we're getting a, a signature of who we are. God is within all of us. So if God is within all of us, all of us have that God energy. We have this energy that perhaps we haven't even tapped into yet. And perhaps this is the, the awakening. Uh, Ephesians 5 and 14, for anything that becomes visible is light. Kind of gives you a different sense of that scripture. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Romans 13 and 11, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than we first believed. And Isaiah, we go to the Old Testament, Isaiah 52 and 1, Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion, put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for there shall no more come in you the uncircumcised and the unclean. So these are the uh, scriptures for awake, awakening, and uh, perhaps this is all one big awakening. So stay tuned for the next video coming up we are going to learn a little bit more about jesus and uh, where did jesus come from so and friends until next time keep living your life with love bye for now <laughs>